Next, from Chicago, Illinois Channel correspondent Jeff Berkowitz sits down with David Applegate, a partner and trial lawyer with the firm Williams, Montgomery & John, and gets his thoughts on which justice Donald Trump will nominate for the U.S. Supreme Court. This runs about 30 minutes. You're watching Public Affairs. Berkowitz is my name and politics is our game. And we'll be doing lots of politics and public policy this evening because we have as our guest David Applegate. And what David is going to do is tell you who the next Supreme Court justice will be. That is who President Trump will nominate to the Supreme Court. And if he or she gets confirmed, that will be the ninth Supreme Court justice. So what you need to know, what you need to know or should know about David Applegate is one, he's a smart guy, two, he's a great trial lawyer, three, he understands the Constitution and he understands this thing, the U.S. Constitution, he understands constitutional law, but more or less, more importantly, he understands the dynamic that we're going through now. So David Applegate, who will President Trump nominate to the U.S. Supreme Court? With the understanding that the, I do not speak for my clients or my firm, I believe which is Williams Montgomery which is and John. Williams Montgomery and a John. great trial lawyer firm. The firm itself is great as trial lawyers. You're a great trial lawyer, as I said. You, you are speaking for David Applegate, is what we're saying. That's correct. Speaking for David Applegate, the next Supreme Court Justice of the United States will be Diane Sykes of the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit right here in Chicago. Yes, Diane Sykes. How would you know it will be Diane Sykes? Because Donald Trump is perhaps the most, not perhaps, the most unpredictable president we've ever had. In truth, I don't know it. Uh, Donald Trump may not yet even know who he's going to appoint. But I, I say this because Donald Trump as Casey Stengel would say, or Yogi Berra, predictions are very t tough to make, especially about the future. But with Donald Trump, I think a high degree of certainty is 50% or more. And I think the chances are 50% or more that Trump will and should nominate Diane Sykes. And she is currally an appellate judge, federal appellate judge, Seventh she, Circuit Court of Appeals. She's out of the state of Wisconsin. She is a tried and true conservative, which Donald Trump has promised to pick. Um, he is notable in recent presidential history for actually having submitted during the campaign uh, a list of nominees from whom he would pick should he be elected. 21. Came up with a list of 21 names, uh, got them jointly from two different organizations, uh, both known for their dedication in, to the Constitution. Which are? Which are the Heritage Foundation, uh, started around 1980 in uh, Washington, D.C., and is a conservative think tank and public policy advisor that committed uh, before the results of the election were known to give its best advice, not only on this issue but on other policy issues, to whoever the nominee would be. Because Heritage Foundation <coughs> wants to see this country succeed and the administration succeed. And the other the, organization? The other organization is the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies, uh, more familiarly known as the Federalist Society, a group of largely conservative libertarians and judges who sprang out of a law school movement in 1982 to offer a more conservative and libertarian and, uh, perspective. Are you a your regular guy, which means you understand Donald Trump, notwithstanding his four to eight billion dollars or so in net worth, he is a regular guy? He knows how to talk to the regular guy. He connects with the he connects auto workers, with, with the steel people. workers, with the people who have been put out of jobs by the so-called trade agreements, or whole, so he would say. He connects with all of them. And you get out into the so-called heartland and ask them, what, why would, would you, a blue-collar worker from a coal mining state or a, a pig rancher in South Dakota or a farmer in Iowa, vote for some billionaire who inherited a real estate empire from his father and moved it from Queens to Manhattan. Okay, why would they? What's the answer? 
They would say, because he cares about me and he cares about the country. And they did not get that sense from the other candidates. Okay, so since he, because he did say, I think back in May, when it was only a list of 10 or 11, and then grew in September to a list of 21, That's he said correct. consistently through this, I will pick, I guarantee you conservatives and anybody else, I will pick from that 21, that list of 21, right? He said that. He said that. Why would he say that? Why, for, why, why did he make that for, commitment? For two reasons in my view. Number one, Donald Trump is smart enough to know what he does not know. Now, a lot of people will laugh at that, but this is a man who puts winning above all else. Okay. And he knows that he doesn't know anything about the Constitution. He doesn't know anything about He doesn't about know anything about this document, who, 27 who, who, pages or so? US he Constitution. knows a lot more about it now than he okay. did He's six, learning. He's six learning. weeks ago. He's, he's learning, and he has a very facile mind, and he's capable okay. of learning at a great rate. But, but he knew nothing about okay. the Constitution. So why does he care about the 21? He knew nothing about the judges, but he knows the people who do know about the judges. And those are organizations like Heritage Foundation and the Federalist okay. Society. So these 21 are true blue conservatives. Each and every one you would be comfortable with as a conservative, if he picked any of these, you would say they're, gonna, they're not going to be like those so-called stealth liberals. They're not going to be a black man, a Stevens, a Souter that Republicans, presidents nominated, thought they were conservative, or so they said, and they turned out to be liberal. That is my belief. That's not going to happen in any of these 21. Uh, that is my belief. And most importantly, you're saying, why is, why is it 50% that he would pick Diane Sykes? Because, number one, as I said, with Donald Trump, 50%, I think, okay. is the highest level highest of the probability. But why, why, why are you saying Diane Sykes as opposed to any because of the Because when you, when you look through the list of 21, um, the, you, can, you can narrow it down to a, to a top eight. And there, and there right. seems and to be a consensus. And you've done that. So this, okay. So 100%, that. almost 100% and, and, sure it'll be within the top out, eight. Out of that top eight, you have two women and six white males. Okay. And this is a very political calculation. And that is the second reason why, 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 why is Donald it political? Why, why is it? And will it be political if Hillary Clinton had been there? Would it, it be political? It, it, ab absolutely, it would be. Whoever the president it, is, it's a political decision. It, it goes becoming a federal judge is a very political decision. Why? I believe it was Antonin Scalia himself who said at the 2014 or the 2015 National Lawyers Convention of the Federalist Society at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C., if you want to become a judge, get involved in politics because you have to have the nomination of the president. The because president, this document says so. The U.S. Constitution the, the says president, president nominates. The, the, right? the president is required to nominate it, but just as Donald Trump doesn't know everything about everything, whoever the president is doesn't know everything about everything. So the president typically looks to home state senators. Because says, also, who who's going to make the recommend? final decision? He can nominate, but who is going to, according to this document, decide if the Nominee will be confirmed, i.e. become a judge. The Senate will decide through their advice and consent power. The total Senate, starting with the Senate Judiciary Committee, the, will hold hearings. They will make a recommendation. It will be like 16 to 18 members on that committee. They will hold a vote. They'll make a recommendation to the Senate. The Senate then will vote, all 100 of them. and for any judge, and there are 800 federal judges or so, about 600 district court judges, 200 appellate judges, and then the nine on the Supreme Court, I, roughly. I, I believe Ballpark. those numbers are approximately correct. All of them the, go through that process, the, like the, we've just said. The, they all go through that process. The number, the, the one number on which I would correct you is not all 100 senators necessarily vote. In fact, there's a very cute, very short story about Justice O'Connor, the first woman, okay. Uh, nominated and confirmed to the Supreme Court. She was voted uni in confirmed unanimously, but only 99 to nothing because Max Baucus of Montana wasn't there. He couldn't be there. He couldn't be and there. And you cannot vote by proxy. You have to be there. So what he did was he sent her a signed copy of his book, A River Runs Through It, as sort of a makeup apology. Okay. But most likely 100 will be there if it's going to be at all close. If it's close, you'll get 100. 
And if it's overwhelming, you could be unanimously confirmed 97, 98. You only need 50, a majority, to get on the district court, what we call the trial court level, those 600. You only need a majority on the appellate level, 50 or more, if everybody's voting. Well, if it's 50 and 50, then the vice president casts the, the deciding vote. So you need 50, and presumably the vice president would vote with the nominee of the Trump. But when you get to the Supreme Court, it changes. How come? It changes because the Constitution itself, of which this is an annotated copy, the entire Constitution, as you know, is a much smaller document. So, yeah, that document is what, like 1,000 <clears throat> pages, annotations, right? It's about 1,100 pages. But the Constitution but it's, it's itself got, is really a thin document, 27 you, pages. You, you can, can read, it's a quick read. You can read on your way to work uh, on you, 25 ride from, from Winneka to it, the Loop. You can carry it in your pocket, and I recommend that people do. Who said that to you about carrying it in the pocket? Um, that would be Dean Gerhard Casper when you were taking constitutional law, right? It was Dean Her Gerhard Casper at the University of Chicago Law School. Who's what did he also, say? Also the one who inspired me to drive downtown and buy my annotated did, constitution. Did, 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 what did the dean say about putting this in your pocket? Do you remember? Uh, no, except that he quoted another constitutional so, scholar. Ladies and gentlemen, put this in your pocket. Here, take it. Just demonstrate. Because you have a pocket, I don't. So you'd put it where? In your suit pocket? I actually have you my have own one? You have copy. your own. So you did it. He in said, ladies and gentlemen, pocket. take that Constitution. This is not only the Constitution, <laughs> but the Declaration of Independence. Okay. He said, take that Constitution, put it in your pocket, and don't leave home without it. And you faithfully, you love this document. Would that be right? I, okay, I love this document. Okay, we've got to pick up the show. We're, we're go, doing a little it's, too much to go It's a very off. simple document. So okay, let's let me, get. Let, let we've got to get right to the other people, unless there's something you want to say. Uh, the, the only point I was going to make is that nothing in the Constitution provides the number of votes that the Senate must give. The Senate's okay. own rules determine that. Used to be they could filibuster. It used to be the Senate could filibuster, which meant it would take 60 votes for judicial confirmation. Uh, during the Obama administration, uh, Democrats were frustrated that Republicans were not acting fast enough or were not cooperative enough in their view. On Harry Reid, they changed the rules, exercised the so-called nuclear option, said you only need a simple majority for confirmation to the lower courts, but the filibuster still remains in place, at least as a theoretical option for the Supreme Court. Okay, so we said Diane Sykes will come back if there's more time, but briefly, 12 years on the appellate court, Seventh Circuit. She also was on the state Supreme Court in Wisconsin, right? Uh, yes, she was. Okay. So some people like her for that because she's got that state. Republicans like state experience as well as federal experience. Uh, you we can come back, but you say she's a true blue conservative. She will adhere to the Constitution, so forth. I want to get to the others quickly. And we'll come back to her. 50% shot. You say 50% chance that Trump goes with her, and then your second. My second choice uh, in terms of a prediction, although he might be my first choice personally, yeah. is William Pryor, uh, the 11th Circuit in uh, sitting in Atlanta. Bill is... Uh, is it sitting in Atlanta or Alabama? Uh, he is from... He's from Alabama, but the Alabama, 11th Circuit sits in Atlanta. But the 11th Circuit sits in Atlanta, Georgia. But they are, okay, so and keep going is, about him. Yeah. He, he is a big uh, Alabama fan. We'll be watching Alabama play Clemson tonight. As we take the show. On uh, the ninth, as, tonight as is the Alabama the show, Clemson. Okay. And we'll be rooting for the team in red. Where uh, do you, well, Tell us, where do you go to school, you know? Uh, Tulane Law School, Law school. interestingly school. enough. Not a real... Most of the Supreme Court, if not all of the Supreme Court, went to Yale or Harvard. This guy goes to Tulane. And His undergraduate is, is like Northeast this, Louisiana. This it's like a, Hoboken. I mean, this right. is another reason I like this guy and another reason he's so high on my list. Uh, he's if, a regular guy? He is a regular guy. He's a great guy to have dinner with. He's a great guy to discuss football with. And what office uh, did he hold prior to? He was attorney general. He, so he's uh, a the, politician. Of the state of has, Alabama. He, he you, gets this stuff. If you want to be a federal judge, get involved in politics. Uh, and the Federal school. Society loves him, right? Um, again, not speaking for the Leonard Society, Leo. but yeah. uh, yes, uh, Federalist Society gives him very high marks. 
uh, stands behind Give the us game. a feel for some of the cases he's decided. What makes him, what makes you confident from the cases? You know, I would be hard pressed to name any of his cases in uh, specifics here late in the afternoon. Oh, I'll tell, I you, tell you Photo ID. He likes these photo ID laws. He says they're constitutional. You know, okay, there's a bit of a burden, but it cuts down on fraud, and that's important interest. I'm, I'm generalizing. Republicans like these photo ID laws, right? Democrats why, don't why, like them. Why would anyone not want to protect the vote by requiring positive identification for citizenship because it's a burden don't you voting. understand if you're a minority rights, you don't have a license you don't drive a car you don't have an id let's it's a burden find, to you, let's, david let's find these people if you can find one person one person in this country who is qualified to vote but cannot afford an id let's I find can't afford you got to take the time you got to go downtown it's, it's, citizenship is a responsibility you think it's worth 50 dollars to go vote uh, if that's what it takes, what, the equivalent. What, what, they don't go downtown all the time, a lot of these people. If you're not worth investing $50 in your country, then maybe you shouldn't be thinking uh, okay. about voting. But so there are a lot but of these Let's opinions. find okay. these people and let's get them IDs. Let's okay. not dumb down democracy. Let's lift it up. Okay. Um, but has he done more? Has he given speeches about the kind of, you know, country this should be? Has he give, talked about like we should, you know, get the government out of education, get not expand the Commerce Clause? Am I getting it right? Am I confusing? Isn't he one of those guys who's done that? Uh, those would be consistent with his view of the Constitution. Is that too I, radical? I, Is I that can, out of the mainstream? It's, it depends on what part of the stream you're standing in. If you're on the, the progressive left, then anyone to the right of Bernie Sanders is out of the Let me read this. I think it's right. I don't have the specific quote time, but Congress should make free trade its main domestic concern. I think this is what Bill Pryor said. Congress should not subvert the Commerce Clause to regulate crime. Subvert the Commerce Clause in this document, the Constitution, to regulate crime, education, land use, family relations, or social policy with all that New Deal, Great Society stuff. That is Bill Pryor. That is not only the guy you say is a 40% chance that he'll be nominated. If you had your way, you would make him the number one choice, right? He would be my number one choice for exactly the You believe in all those things I just read? I, I do. And you believe the Constitution, to the extent he is a Supreme Court justice, could push the country in that nation following faithfully this document, you would be a big Bill Pryor supporter in that push? A Supreme Court justice can only help decide cases that come before the court. So it's a bit of a myth to say that the Supreme Court is going to push us in this direction or that direction. If you could, they have what, some leeway. What they? we have had for okay. some decades now is activist groups pushing an agenda that look for a particular case that they can then get before the Supreme Court, knowing that we have wandered so far in the 220, okay. almost seven years now since ratification of the Constitution. I think I've got that. You're right. a strict constructionist. I, I'm absolutely a strict You're constructionist. You're a textual originalist. A look at the words, look at the statute. If Jeff, we, we, are, we are lawyers. If you were going to interpret a contract, you would, of course, look to the language okay. of the More contract. More importantly, is Diane Sykes that kind of person? Yes, she is. Is Bill Pryor that kind of person? Bill Pryor is that kind of person. Number three. Who's number three on your list? Uh, number three on my list would be Joan Larson. Uh, Tell us about Joan. They, she's uh, currently on the Michigan Supreme Court, which is an elected position. She's held for about 16 months, I believe. Before that, she was a law why would, professor. Why would you in say she'd be third likely? Not only did Trump know nothing about this person, the Federalist Society can't know much, the Heritage can't know much. She hasn't been on the court, this appellate court, for like 16 months. What, did she rant and rave as a, she, well, she was a law school professor at University she, of Michigan she, Law School? She, did she tell everybody, I love the Constitution, or what? She, she, she's a law professor, she has a written record. She also. What's her written record as a law she professor? She also. Okay is the youngest of the 21 people. All right, she's Trump's 48. List. She could be there another 40, yeah, 50 years possibly. So if your thinking is you want someone 
who will support your view of the Constitution and your view of how to read the Constitution, um, maybe you want to get somebody young. She's, a, she's she also... She was clerked? Who did she clerk for? Uh, she clerked for Scalia. the justice. She would be replaced. Anton Scalia. Anthony Scalia. Who you have in your office, as we saw, maybe we'll show that. You have a replica of the Supreme Court, and most importantly, you have a replica of Anton Scalia right in your office. Well, I Do you like pray to him every day? <laughs> no, I don't pray to him <laughs> every day. I, I keep that as a reminder that um, he was the third Supreme Court justice I ever met personally, okay. and the first one okay. so she's I ever good. had as we a gotta, We got to go because we, I squandered some time. So that she's number three, and number four in your hit parade would be. Uh, no, oh, wait, what's the chance? So you said 40% chance, did you say, for prior? as far as your assessment of Trump. Trump, you're saying Trump 50% likely to go with Sykes, 40% for, 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 with Pryor. 40% with Pryor. And how much with jo Joan? Joan Larson Joan. is a dark horse at 3%. 3%. 3 so we're up to 93%. Now we're going to number four. We're really down the, here. The number four, 2% uh, tied with Thomas Hardiman out of the Third Circuit would be Ray Kethledge out of the Eighth Circuit. Um, What's Kep so good about Ray? What, what do you like about Ray? Um, what, what I like about Ray is he has both prosecutorial experience in the sense of working for the Judiciary Committee. He was Judiciary Committee counsel to uh, Spencer Abraham. He was also law clerk to Justice Kennedy. Um, he's 50 years old. Good he credentials. Shows, uh, Michigan law shows strong adherence to the Constitution. And he's been on the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals for eight years, so he should have a good record. People who study this should be pretty comfort comfortable he's going to be conservative, right? Th that's correct. And he's 49. He's another youngster. Long time there, right? I, I believe he just turned yeah. 50. But turned 50, sorry, he's, okay. He's a relative youngster. Yeah. Uh, what as about, is, what about as Tom Hardiman? Thomas Hardiman at 51. Uh, uh, Hardman is an interesting choice, and some people would put him first, including, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the host of this show. Yeah, because he's be from Pennsylvania. He, Look, he, not to be political, you went with Sykes from Wisconsin. That's a big state for Trump. You went with Pryor from Alabama. Okay, not so much a big state in getting elected, but his attorney general is from there. In fact, from, I think from the same town. I think, uh, I think perhaps Pryor was born in Mobile, Alabama. Certainly Sessions is from Alabama. So that counts. And then, you know, Larson's from Michigan. Trump won Michigan. You like her. And now you like, uh, you know, well, what's, where is uh, Kethledge from? I don't know. Eighth Circuit, is that Iowa? I don't know. Somewhere around there. So, but then, then Hardiman, which who I like, you're right, Pennsylvania. He wouldn't be president if he hadn't won Pennsylvania. He's got to love that. This guy, I think he drove a cab to get through law school. You can't get more regular than that, right? He, he is a regular guy. He's from Pennsylvania. He's very strong First Amendment. He's very strong in the Second Amendment. Um, and he has ties to both Democrats and Republicans. Um, one of his relatives ran... And better law school, like better education. Uh, not quite Yale or Harvard, uh, but Notre Dame and Georgetown, two very good schools, twice confirmed by the Senate, last time in 2007 for Third Circuit, 95-0. How can these guys really... Democrats vote against him now. Is ninety-five zero? See what I mean? Federal society likes him. This, this is this is my pick. I, I got to go against be, you. I, be, if I were Trump, I'm going with Hardiman. And you you may well be right, um, but politics is very situational, and what someone is in favor of when they're in the majority can be very different when they're in the minority. Um, Okay, so uh, you're uh, saying Trump's Hardiman, got the majority, he's, he should be, if they either no, are I, unlike... No, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that a Senate that confirmed Thomas Hardiman unanimously to the Court of Appeals is not necessarily going okay. to confirm him unanimously. Oh, I see. Yes, it's Supreme quite Court. different. Now we're talking Supreme Court. So we only have a minute or two left. Let's just go through quickly. The last three, you put it like 1% each, right? Just give us their names and their background, but uh, they're not too likely to... Trump's not too in, likely in, to go with them. In my view, uh, not too likely. Who are they? they Who's are number six? Extremely well qualified. No particular order. Okay. Except tied for, alphabetically, tied for six. Tied for six would be Steve Culleton, 
a uh, 54-year-old of the Eighth Circuit, which sits in St. Louis, who's from Iowa. Princeton and Yale, we like uh, that. Or, Prince, well, yeah, I don't, maybe I, we don't like that, yeah. Uh, some people like that. Okay. Justice Scalia suggested in his Obergefell dissent, maybe that was Significant a experience at the, at the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, so they know his record. He's been around for a long time. And uh, also he, tied for that, that last place, so to speak. Is uh, Neil Gorsuch out of the Tenth Circuit in Denver. 49-year-old who went to uh, Columbia, Harvard, and Oxford, clerk for David Sentel, very colorful judge on the D.C. Circuit, and then two Supreme Court justices, the late Byron Wizard White and Anthony Kennedy. Uh, he's a niece of Ann Gorsuch, the first female EPA administrator. And then finally, Raymond Grunder, all out of the Eighth Circuit, who is a 54-year-old blue-collar guy, comes from a broken home, worked his way through Wash U, uh, got his bachelor's, master's, and JD, and as far as I know, is the only one in the mix who has actually been shot by his own father. Okay, but so to encamp, to go back and briefly in one minute, you have eight of these people, but two of them, Diane Sykes and Bill Pryor, you put at ninety percent likely it's going to be one of those two, and you say. It's Diane Sykes. I think it's going to be Diane Sykes. And tell and us why it's, again, why I'm, it's political as well as, well, one, Trump is comfortable that he meets the demands of conservatives to have a true conservative that won't change, right? But the, that is correct, but it's political because the process is political, and you have to win votes. What will Democrats do if, on it's, the if it's one of those side. two? If it's Sykes or, or it's, it's Pryor, if, what, if, what will if, the Democrats do? If it's prior, they may even filibuster. Uh, Which means they'd, they'd have, the Republicans would have to come up with, if they if they kept all 52 Republicans, they would they need eight Democrats. They would need at least eight Democrats. Can they get them um, for one of those two? That's, for why, prior or Sykes? that's why he's only my second choice. Okay. Sykes, yes. Sykes, they can surely get it because she's a woman. Sykes, she's female. I think it's going to be a lot harder to filibuster. Prior was actually filibustered for his, his current position when he was first nominated, then got a recess appointment and was confirmed relatively narrowly. That's right. So you understanding politics say you're going with Sykes, you know Bill Pryor, you've met him, you've dined with him, you like this guy, but he may not get through, but Sykes you're sure she should. Why get Sykes, involved in a get nasty through. filibuster and then have to make Sykes your second choice? Is that your point? That's my point especially for an administration that is going to be fought tooth and nail on every single appointment and almost every single cabinet position. Thank you so much, David Applegate. David Applegate is one of those masters of the universe. As he looks out from this beautiful office, seriously, you look, see at the expanse of the loop, you see all of those fantastic buildings in Lake Michigan, uh, you try cases, people come down that long hall we may have shown, they come to you and they say, I have something that may actually end up in the Supreme Court. You've been there. It's not like some of these guys who get into the end zone, you know, and they dance and get penalized right. because I, act like you've, you've been, been in that end zone before. before. You don't have to act. You've been to the Supreme Court before. Your firm has been there before. Williams, Montgomery, and John, great trial lawyers, Barry Montgomery, Peter John, David Applegate, Chris Barber. They're all good, but those are four I know well, right? No dispute there? I'm not going to dispute And that. you now know who the next nominee will be. It will be Diane Sykes. Uh, there's not, just not much excitement. I hate to take it away from you folks. We may come back and talk about it some more. But on January 9th, if you wanted to know who the next nominee of the Supreme Court was going to be, as you'll find out on January 20th or thereabouts, where did you go? You went to public affairs. And you come back next week and every week to public affairs.